Good morning, Constantia Berg. Good to be with you this morning. I wanted to give you a brief update on behalf of the eldership team about our in-person gatherings that we had planned for the 8th and the 29th of November this month. Uh, we've come to consensus as an eldership team that we're not going to be gathering this Sunday, the 8th of November. We're recognizing that there's a real spike uh, here in the southern suburbs of COVID cases. And so we think it wise for us to not gather. Uh, you know, we're a slightly older congregation. Many of our family members and parents are a lot older. So we're wanting to love and protect them. We recognize that there are many complications if someone were to be COVID positive, maybe even asymptomatic. Uh, you know, there's, um, it, it gets complicated with needing to isolate. We know you've got work commitments, you've got kids, you've got schooling. And so we're feeling uh, that it's going to be best for us uh, to not gather. We'll keep the 29th of November in the calendar. We'll play it by ear. We'll see what President Ramaphosa has to say to us and how things unfold. So not gathering in person on the 8th of November and we'll communicate from there. We are encouraging you. We do believe we're better together, even if that's in our online gathering. So as you're able to, as you feel comfortable and no pressure if you're not comfortable uh, to gather with people in your home to enjoy the Sunday meetings, you know, whether it's a other family or in your life group or with a couple of friends as you're able to as you feel comfortable we encourage you to meet together and if you're not comfortable together with others keep joining us uh, we are better together and that we're trusting God that the time will come and when we're able to gather together safely well that's it from me God bless Welcome everyone. We're so glad you could join us this morning. Yes. My name is Nari. I am a leader here in the Common Ground. I run a life group together with my husband Stephen and we're happy to be here. And my name is Klaas and together with my wife, uh, yeah, we serve on the eldership team. We were ordained as elders like two weeks ago. So it's, it's really fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Elder, elder Klaas. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, so welcome to those who are watching online. We're really excited to have you here, as well as to those who are joining with their life groups and those who are joining in from home by themselves. Um, and we would like to really give a shout out to those who are joining for the very first time. So we would like you to, if you don't mind, please um, just sign the guest form that's in the description in the video that we're on currently, because we'd like to get in touch with you later. Fantastic. Over to some family news and some announcements. And I'm just going to get my, my piece of paper here because we've got a lot of birthdays and I haven't learned all the names. So we've got some birthdays um, and we want to celebrate them with you. Julie Ikas, uh, huge congratulations. And then I've got it on my list, our own Rosina last Friday. Um, yeah, big congrats. And at the same day, Simon Peters, our life group leader, the leader of all our life groups, he also had his birthday last Friday. Yolanda Offert had a birthday in the last two weeks. And then a big one, um, Larvette Neft, last Sunday she turned 60, and 60 is the new 50, so fantastic, congratulations. Um, we also have two wedding anniversaries in the past, past week, Sam and Wade Pretorius, eight years, and that's eight years is fantastic, but it's nothing compared to John and Frances Willoughby Williams, 50 years of, of marriage. Big congratulations and what an achievement and, and you guys are still going very strong so it's really good to see. Let's go to a giving moment. Obviously we can't do an, a giving moment online but let me first say thank you so much to all of you who have been giving uh, so faithfully on a regular basis. It's really really helped the church and giving um, is really an investment in, in, in the church and we, we just thank you for that. Uh, the good news is as well that we as a church, we give away about 10% of our own income to other people around us, to the likes of common good, etc. So uh, that is also continuing and that's really needed. Um, God loves a cheerful giver, so we would just like to encourage you in that. Um, details and the right giving codes, they're all in the description of the video. So over to you, Nihari. Yes, so just coming out of giving, which is one way of worship actually, we're about to enter into the next phase of worship, which is our singing. But I'd like to read a scripture for us, just to maybe get us into the mood. So I'm going to read from Psalm 100, verse 1 to 5, which says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. 
enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name for the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. We're so excited to have a Constantia uh, band leading us in worship today. And so for those of you who are joining us from home, please stand up and worship the Lord together with us. Let's worship the Lord indeed. Enjoy. Oh, 
dear Lord, thank you so much for this incredible time that we get to gather together to worship you together. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would speak to us and change our hearts and learn more about you today. We ask you to come and dwell with us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Yes, and uh, parents, now is a great time to, uh, to set up your kids uh, so that the kids can go to, to their online areas. And uh, yeah, we're also praying for the kids that they will really enjoy it and that it will be an impactful moment for, uh, for our kids and, and youth. who is an amazing preacher who loves God, who walks with God, and he serves the Lord as a leader in a congregational meeting in Weinberg. So, over to you, Andre. Hi, everyone. My name is Andre. It's a delight and a privilege to be sharing God's words with you today. I am very excited that we've gone back to the book of Mark. It has been a long series that we've been going through, and today it's week 19. And I'm going to be sharing from Mark chapter 7, uh, verse 1 to 23. The Bible event we're about to look at is the interaction between Jesus and the Pharisees. In fact, his disciples included as well. Jesus crashed with the Pharisees over the issue of what makes a man clean or unclean. Uh, my aim is to walk us through these 23 verses and examine together Jesus' response to what makes a man clean or unclean. And there are three things that I'd like to share with us. The first one is beware of doing the right things with the wrong motives. And the second one is beware of corner-cutting spirituality. And uh, thirdly, beware of outside-in spirituality. So I'm going to ask Shane, who is going to be reading for us, please uh, turn with me to Mark chapter 11, verse 1 to 23. Now when the Pharisees gathered to him, with some of these scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all of the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. There are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written? This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain they do worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, you, are fine, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your own tradition. For Moses said, Honor your mother and your father, and whoever reviles the father or mother must surely die. But you say, If a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corbin, that, that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and many such things you do. And he called the people to him again, again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand, there is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he entered the house 
and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from, from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart but his stomach, and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. Thank you, Shane. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for the privilege and the opportunity given to me that I can share your words with, um, with many, many people right now, Christ followers and those who are exploring the claims of who you are. Thank you for the Holy Scriptures. It is my prayer that today God would make your way clear to us, that you'd, re you'd review yourself freshly to, to us as, as we go through the scriptures. Dear Lord, I pray for homecoming, for the brothers and sisters who have been searching for years the truth of who you are. I pray for my fellow Christ followers, that God, as I share your way, I pray for joy. I pray that they would open their heart, O oh Lord, to your encouragement. They would open their heart, O oh God, to your correction. And I pray for humility for me as I share your word with them. In your name, Christ Jesus, I pray. Amen. Great. Before we can go through each verse, I want to explain the word Corban. There is a way that, as Chanel was reading, it's in verse 11. I just want to explain the way to us, then we can carry on. What is Corban? Now, we found this, the word Corban is only found in Mark chapter 7, verse 11. The interpretation is given in the same verse. It means devoted to God as a gift. The word describes something to be offered to God or given to the sacred treasury in the temple. It's something, you know, if something is Corban, it was dedicated and set apart for God's use. Now, what, what we found here in terms of Jesus' interaction with the Pharisees, the Pharisees took this legitimate carbon offering and they misused it to defraud their parents and enrich themselves. They actually misused this uh, amazing, um, amazing, a gift that God had actually asked them as an offering for them to practice, but they are misusing it so that they can defraud their parents and enrich themselves. As a result, the law of God was nullified. You know, the law of God was nullified as a, as a result. Jesus tells the Pharisees that their misuse of Corban was an evil act. It was an evil act because God never intended that the good principle of devoting something to the temple should be twisted to dishonor parents or to dishonor fathers and mothers. That was not God's, uh, that's not what God intended. So, you know, you find different cultures and religion create different rituals and customs that people of the culture and religion are expected to obey. Uh, for instance, um, personally, in my culture, I was born and raised in a culture that favors uh, men more than women. When it comes to the scene of adultery, you find that the men are more favored. The women will be given some form of punishment. The elders from both families will come and they'll speak some words like a curse. So that was really, it's really an harsh treatment 
uh, on women, but when it comes to men, they really receive no punishment, they receive nothing of that form. To me, this is unbiblical. You can see in this culture, they try to take something which is, they take something which is in the couch and elevate it above the scriptures, because when it comes to sin, there is no such a thing as a gender-based sin. Sin is sin, whether it's a woman, whether it's a male. So this is the issue that um, Jesus is trying, crushed with the Pharisees. They are trying, we are looking at the issue of tradition versus commandments. And in verse 1 and 2, we see that a delegation of Pharisees and the theological experts were sent all the way from Jerusalem to critique the ministry of Jesus. It appears that they had, they had already made up their mind to say that Jesus is a bad man. They had already actually decided in their mind that Jesus was a bad man that would bring harm to the people of Israel. How, how true is this that they had already made up their mind? It's true because they found an opportunity to accuse Jesus. And we see it in verse 5. The Pharisees accused Jesus. They attacked Jesus saying, how is it that your disciples are eating without having to wash their hands? How is it that they are eating and not following, not living according to the tradition of the elders? What they saw did not impress them at all. But when we look at Jesus' response, Jesus did not protest that the Pharisees were unfairly judging him for his disciples' behavior. The reason why he did not protest because the behavior of his disciples reflected his teaching. They were well taught. Now, this is something that if you're a Christ follower, you're listening to me, I think you have to understand that your behavior and my behavior and our way of living, when people look at us, they don't see us, they see Jesus. The reason the Pharisees accused Jesus was simply because they expected the people to do whatever they said without question. Even if some of their traditions made no sense, but they wanted people to follow their traditions. In verse 3 and 4, the Pharisees had added many laws to the law of Moses. These were called tradition of the elders and were often considered to be more important, to be even more above God's words. And this is the problem that Jesus is trying to address. The issue of washing hands to them was not just so that they can clean their hands when they came from a marketplace. They actually went further. They make it to become a ritual that when they wash their hands, it's a symbol, it's a sign, as though because they were interacting with some Gentiles at the marketplace, therefore it is a sign of purification to make themselves clean from the unclean. You know, they consider themselves to be too special. And this leads me to my first point. Beware of doing the right things with the wrong motives. Yes, it is possible. We are in danger. It is possible to do and say all the right things, but to do it for the wrong reasons. And let me speak a little bit to those of you, maybe you're exploring the claims of Jesus you know, when you look at a particular group of people who claim to be Christ followers or a particular local community or a church, and you see things that are not okay, instead of straight away accusing Jesus or rejecting Jesus, I would encourage you to go to the scriptures. I would encourage you to go to the word of God, to check it, to read for yourself and allow Jesus to speak to you. And I encourage you to even approach the church leaders and speak to them and question the things. And the Christ followers, we have also to be careful. If you are told to do things, you have to check what you are asked to do. Uh, you know, you put it, you check the word of God and said, what is the word of God saying about these things? In verse 6, we see Jesus he respond to the question asked to him in verse 5. He respond to them with a quote from Isaiah 29 verse 13. He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. This is an interesting response. 
Jesus called them hypocrites, which simply means mask-wearing actors. He said, you guys are acting. You guys, there is something that you've put in front of you. This is not real you. How come you guys are really making this issue become a big issue? You are hypocrites. Today we face the same danger. We can do and say all the right things, but we can be motivated by wrong things, such as a desire to look godly to others and earn a reputation of spirituality. You are doing stuff because you want to look godly so that you can earn the reputation of spirituality. And Jesus insisted that a deep love for God and the knowledge of God is what should motivate us to say and to do the right thing. If you love God, if you've got a deep love for God, if you really engage yourself in trying to understand who God is, that should be the motivation. That should be the motivation for you to do or to say the right thing. Now, let me say this. It is true to say a responsible citizen as, you know, is one who, who votes, for instance. If he it is true to say a responsible citizen has to vote, but we must be very careful not to turn you know, politics or political parties into a religion. Think about this, because in our, in our context, in our culture, we can easily do that or elevate the values of a political party above God's word. It is possible to do that. It is possible to do the right thing for the wrong, with the wrong motives. We carry on in verse 7. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. Very interesting. You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe, in other ways, or set up your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever revile father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father and his mother, whatever you would have gained from me in Corbin, that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother. That's making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down and many such things you do. Here again, we see that Jesus insisted that the kind of a Jewish life and the faith that Pharisees practiced was outside of God's will, was outside of God's scriptures, was outside. This is not what they were, they were supposed actually to be teaching the people. What a terrible thing if Jesus looked at your life and he looked at my life and declared, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down and many things you do. What a terrible thing if Jesus looked at your life and looked at, looked at my life and said that. And this leads me to point two. Beware of a corner cutting spirituality. Yes, it is possible to find religious excuses to disobey the true teachings of the Bible or the clear teachings of the Bible. It is possible. Now, the thing about man-made religion is that many small inconveniences and sacrifices are imposed on its followers. But no significant large sacrifices are called for, especially those that cut against the grain of our selfishness. Now, I want you to follow me carefully. No wonder Gandhi would say, I like your Christ, I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. I think he had a reason to say that because you look at this man, you know, you look at Jesus, he said, you are claiming to be following this Savior. You say that he saved your life. You say that he's paid a high price. But when I look at you, the way you are living your life does not correspond with the person you are following, the person you are claiming to be following. He looked at what Jesus did. He paid. He, he gave up himself. You know, gave up himself to the crime that he never committed. Punished, crucified. For your sake and for my sake, 
Yet the way we are living our lives, it got other people to question whether we really understand the person we are following or whether we value what that person did for us. And Mother Teresa would comment on the quote from Gandhi. He said, Gandhi felt fascinated at knowing Christ. He met Christians and felt let down. He said he met Christians and felt let down. Friends, the Pharisees, this was the case of the Pharisees. They were willing to wash their hands every, before every meal. They were so committed to do that, but they were not willing to support their parents financially. They went against what the scripture required in Exodus chapter 20 verse 12. They went against, they dishonored their parents. It is possible. We are in danger to be the modern Pharisees. Let me speak about something. Some of you, maybe you are blessed with a big space. I'm speaking to Christ followers. God has blessed you with an amazing place whereby every time you wake up in the morning, you look at your couch, you look at your garden, you are so excited, you try to protect it. You want your couch, you don't even want the kids to jump in them, you protect it. I'm telling you, in 15 years' time, they are going to look the same. Is that what you are going to stand before God and say, I had used my home for your glory. I am wanting to challenge you and say this to you. It is okay for those couches to be damaged as long as you utilize your space to, to the glory of God. Get people in your house. Get them to open the word of God. Debate with them. And I'm so grateful to encourage those of you who are already doing it. You are calling people into your lives. You are calling people into your private space. You are saying to your children, say, you know, this is our private space, but because of what Christ has done for us, we are going to do a sacrifice. We are going to open our home and we are going to invite other people. We are going to open the Bible. We are going to debate. We are going to journey together. We are going to feast on Jesus. We are going to use these couches, whether they will get damaged or not, but we will use this space to the glory of God. And some of you are already doing it. I want to encourage you to continue to do that because that's just a small sacrifice that you can do. What's the use of feeding yourself with a lot of great podcasts, you know, a lot of good teachings, coming to the building on Sunday or meeting online and following all the teachings? What a use when you do them, but there is no sacrifice. You are doing it for you. And when I think about the way consumerism is increasing in our culture today, in the world today, it's not only outside the church. It is even in the church that you get to be fed, but what next? It is for your only good. Can we make a sacrifice? When last did you pause and look at what is happening in the country and say, I am going to be, I'm going to go on my knees to pray and I'm going to lift up my hands. I'm going to cry out to God and say, God, please, whatever issue of corruption in our nation, God, won't you bring to light the truth of your word? Won't you take out the people who are really causing this nation to go? The poor have been oppressed. When, when, when last did you actually pause? Or are you just looking into your own space and what is happening? What is is going well with you and trying to protect. These are things that we can do. No wonder Gandhi had a reason to say, when he looked at the way we are living our lives, he questioned whether we understand the person of Jesus Christ, whether we understand the sacrifice of what Jesus did for us. He went to the cross on our behalf. He paid the most highest price that you may receive life, that I may receive life and life to the full. When last did you pause and look at what is happening in Ivory Coast and say, God, I want you with the issue of elections. We don't want people to die. What is happening in Nigeria? You pray for God's peace. When last did you look at our continent and say, God, raise men and women who are, they know you, they fear you, that they may lead us in a direction that you want them to lead us. We carry on from verse 14. And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside of a person that by going into him can defile him, can make him unclean. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And we jump to verse, verse 19. Since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled. Does he declare all foods clean? Again, the interaction continues. It's trying to understand here what makes man 
clean or unclean. And Jesus is saying it's not what goes into his stomach because it's not touching the heart. And in verse 20, he said, you know, what comes out of a person is what defiles him, is what makes him unclean. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts. Sexual morality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. They make a person unclean. This is the, the time Jesus, Jesus just mentioned the sin by name. And this leads me to my final point. Beware of outside in spirituality. Beware of that. Jesus overruled the food laws that Moses had given Israel. He overruled that. He said it is what enters. He says since it, whatever enters the man, it's not going on his heart, but it's going into the stomach. It's what comes out of a person that destroys a person. Jesus certainly did not object to them you know, washing their hands before a meal. He did not object to that. But the problem was they made a small mountain. They make it to look as though it was a big mountain. They look at Table Mountain and try, for instance, to compare it to Kilimanjaro. They made an issue of washing hands become so critical that they were not concerned about what was uh, what, was, what, what was the things that, that God was against, you know? They, they push what was their own tradition in wanting to go above God's word. And I have to say here that uh, if Jesus is to walk in Cape Town today, I think he wouldn't really oppose much the idea of putting on a mask as long as it's not connected to eternal life. For health reasons, I, I think he would actually say, yes, I will do. If you stand before the shop, can you sanitize your hand, please, Lord Jesus? I think Jesus would, would probably give his hand. I, I just think he would probably. But as long as it's not connected to the issue of getting eternal life. I think this is what these guys were trying to do. They allowed... Something which was in their tradition, something which, was, which is not a massive issue, but they made it so much important to the point that, you know, it, it's starting to undermine the word of God. When we read the Gospels, we get the impression that Jesus had little tolerance for religious rituals and traditions. He had little tolerance to that. He focused on obeying God and loving people. Now, let me ask you a question. How is your obeying going? How is your obeying of God? How is your obeying of God in your life? How are you loving other people? How are you loving other people who are not like you? Who don't talk like you? Who don't speak, who don't speak like you? Who don't do things like you? who don't actually go to the same entertainment as you, how is your loving of those people? How are you obeying God in terms of some sacrifices that maybe God is wanting you to, 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 to do? Is it all for your comfort? If this church is not doing according to my will, therefore it is not the right place for me? If, he, if I'm not hearing from the leaders saying the right things that I want to hear, therefore, I don't think this is my place. God's word is there to encourage us, to rebuke us, to, to challenge us, actually to call for more out of us. In verse 20 and 23, Jesus, you know, tells what makes a man clean or unclean. He gave the final conclusion. Jesus measured being clean by a different set of standards to his accusers. This is a different set of standards to his accusers. The one he looked, you know, the accusers, they looked at externals such as religious rules and rituals 
Jesus looked at the heart. He saw man's heart. A pure heart leads to godly conduct. If you've got a pure heart, that is immense in God's word, understanding who God is, understanding Jesus' love, the, what comes out of a person like that, you know, it is, it, 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 it is something that is going to build up others, something that is going to contribute to build up the body of Christ. Even in our communities, Jesus is looking at the heart of a person. and not what is going inside. He never apologized his answer to the Pharisees. And he wants them to know to understand, and he wants you to understand that our belief and our behavior have to be based on the, God, on the word of God, not on any religion or religious traditions. Here are some special touches to qualify my three points that I've just given us above, uh, the, the three points I've given us. When what we know about God is disconnected from who God really is, we are in danger of developing ways to appear godly without prioritizing God in our hearts. We are in danger. If we, what we know about God you know, and who God really is, if we've got a wrong view of God, we are in danger of prioritizing wrong stuff. And, and Jesus is calling these people, you guys are hypocrites. You, you say that you know him, but what you are doing is not really exactly what the scriptures are wanting you to do. You hypocrites or mask-wearing actors. If we make every effort to cover our sin and hide our need for repentance... We clearly have not understood the gospel. This is exactly what the Pharisees did. That's what they hide their need for repentance. They, they were hiding their sin. They did not really understand the scriptures. And we are in danger of that as well. Now here is a question I have for us. How are we to respond to Jesus? How are we to respond to Jesus? Because... You know, I want us to know that the times have changed, but the hearts of men have not. Our hearts have not changed. We are in danger of falling into the same trap as the Pharisees. Our hearts haven't changed. We are the same for the Pharisees. Their response was to cover sin instead of confessing and repenting. How about you? How about me? Are we trying to cover our sin? Are we trying to avoid to really come clean before God? If I have to speak on our behalf in terms of how to respond to Jesus, I would say we have to recognize our need for mercy and not to have confidence in self-righteousness. That was the mistake with the Pharisees. They were looking down on others but not really realizing that they need God's mercy. I love it when I read Luke chapter 18. We see the tax collector went away justified, not based on his deeds, but he was justified because of God's grace. God's grace and his mercy. There is no chance for any of us if not on the grace of God. Friends, we have to surrender to Jesus in the way that we talk, in the way that we walk. This, this is mainly for those of you who are Christ followers, but if you are not a Christ follower, you can go and get the word of God, read, and let me tell you, Jesus is not a leader who is calling us to the things that himself never walked through. In fact, he sacrificed a lot for us. He gave his one and only life so that you may, lie, you may have life, and not just have life, but according to John 10.10, 10, that you may have life and life to the full. What about if you say that I reject this Jesus? In fact, his claims, you know, is, is not, is not, a, is not who he said he is, he's not actually a savior, he's not a leader. What about that's where you are standing and said, I don't see any truth in this person called Jesus. 
Now the question I have for you is this. What do you plan to plead as your defense? What are you relying on? When we look at the interaction with the Pharisees, what, what was their defense? They actually felt, they tried. These are the things that they added to the law that was given to them. If you move a little bit far from your defense or whatever you are trying to defend yourself with, if you said, you know, if you recognize your need for mercy, it will transform how you judge others and all them to account, particularly for, for things that God is not holding them to account for. You are not going to be like the Pharisees. And I, can I encourage you to, to go, you know, to get to know the word of God for yourself. We must learn and distinguish between human traditions and divine scripture. Can I also ask you to say you have to, you should be doing the external things such as, you know, saving the poor. All these things are good, but we have to do them with a heart that is engaged. Not a heart that is disconnected from the people we are to love and a heart that is disconnected from God. Just a quick recap. I want us to know this. It is possible to do or say all the right things, but to do it for the wrong reasons. I want us to know that it is possible to find religious excuses to disobey the teachings of the Bible. But know that Jesus overruled the food laws that Moses had given to Israel. He overruled all that. Now let's go into the time that I want to land with. I want us to go into a moment of reflection. Where you are, I want you to take a pen or I want you to just write this down. Think deeply about your life and I'm putting a question in front of us. What belief and behavior do you hold so dear that they seem important than clear biblical teachings? Take a moment to reflect on the message and the question in front of you. Write down the behavior or the beliefs, the things that you believe about Jesus. Now, I want you to bring those things before God now in prayer. And I want to lead us in prayer. Let's, wherever you are, bow your head down and join me as we pray. Dear Lord, thank you for your holy scriptures. Dear Lord, I thank you that you have spoken to us. I pray for my brother, I pray for my sister, I pray for, yeah, for their humility that they've surrendered the things before you. Wake in and through them. Be their Lord and Savior. In your name, Christ Jesus, I pray. Holy Spirit, won't you do your work in us? Not only now, but I pray that you'd continue to do your work in us. In your name, Christ Jesus, I pray. Amen. Thank you so much to those of you who maybe it's your first time that you've written those things down and pray that prayer. I pray that the Holy Spirit will continue to help you on the journey as you continue to, to, to explore the claims of our Lord Jesus Christ. And to, to all Christ followers, may the peace of our Lord be with you all. Shalom to you. And welcome back. And Andre, thank you so much. Merci beaucoup for this, this inspiring message. It's been a long time since you've been visiting us in, uh, in Constantienburg, so it was really great to, uh, to see and hear you. Let's also, as a church, uh, let's, let's just be the church and share the good news of Jesus with people around us so that we can really be an impact in, uh, in the valley here. For those of you that are still fairly new in your faith journey, we've got a great little gift for you. Uh, which is the Ignite booklet. It's a 31-day journey where you really are exploring the Bible and, and what it means to be a Christ follower. So you can download it. The link is, uh, is in the description of this video. And it's a great little booklet and it's a gift from us to you. If you're new to Common Ground Constantinople, we really would love to get your details. So please don't forget to give us your details in the form that's in the description of the video that you're currently watching. And we also have details for you to, um, to follow up if you would like to join a life group or if you'd like to receive prayer or connect with the pastor or join one of our online prayer meetings. 
or in fact access any of our online resources which we have a lot of and all of those details are in the description below and then don't forget uh, today after the meeting at 10 45 zooming for coffee and it's a great opportunity to meet some new people in in our church family so please be there it would be great join us next week as we continue with with the book of mark before we go i'd like to read a benediction for all of us may you be rooted and built up in him strengthened in the faith and overflow with thankfulness in him may his grace be with you thank you very much for joining us and uh, all have a great rest of the sunday thank you so much